All right, we have a, a final speaker, a keynote speaker, and that speaker is gonna take us back where we started basically, um, which was energy. When I, when I started off my keynote address uh, yesterday, um, I'm, I mentioned that, you know, really, one of the reasons we think about energy a lot around sustainability is because we understand how it underpins uh, everything. And not only how it underpins, but how it enables all the other stuff that we do. Um, and of course, it's the big one when we're thinking about um, the impacts that we have. So we're gonna wrap up with Roger Sutton, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Orion Energy, plus a whole bunch of other things. <laughs> really good to be here. It's really nice to see so many familiar faces. Really good to have a topic which doesn't include talking about earthquakes and how you run infrastructure through earthquakes. Um, and in fact, I, often I, I saw on the program there was a bit about biking and cycling and transport stuff. In fact, it would have been quite nice to talk about cycling because I'm a keen cyclist and I often sort of start off talks about sustainability talking about me as a cyclist. You know, I ride my bike to work, I keep a suit hanging up out of the airport now so I can bike to the airport, which is really nice if you've got a long day in Wellington, some windowless boardroom. But it's kind of nice also sort of being, um, I don't know, being the 18 year old student biking back and forth to Varsity again. And a while ago I tell a story how I was biking down Barbados Street going home. I no longer ride Barbados Street because I think it was too dangerous. And I was riding down Barbados Street and um, a woman pulled out of the, the cathedral, the Catholic cathedral there, and nearly ran me over. So I sort of responded as I shouldn't have. I sort of banged on her bonnet and made a gesture at her which was not so friendly. Anyway, she, she gave me a sort of a, like a look like, who are you? Two sets of lights down the road, she made a point of pulling up beside me, and wound down the old passenger side window, as you can do in you know, all our modern cars, and said, why don't you get yourself a proper job, and then you can buy yourself a car. So, <laughs> but she didn't know that I worked in Orion, right. she certainly didn't know we've got these great databases over that match up, you know, registration numbers to connection numbers. So I see her regularly at the supermarket buying candles. <laughs> the earthquake didn't have much impact on her. Um, you know, I mean, I was, uh, uh, Orion has sort of done this demand side stuff for a long time. And the thing that really, so what I was going to do, I was going to talk a bit about the demand side stuff we've done, some of the stuff we're doing, and why it's going to be more important going forward in the power system we have of the future. So this is a graph showing about what um, the energy, energy load growth on our network has been and the peak load growth. So the solid bars are um, the peak load, and the line is the way energy has climbed. So I run the transport company. Orion really is a distribution business. If you think about it, the people, the meridians, the contacts, they grow lots of apricots and oranges down in central Otago, and I, I arrange for those apricots and those nectarines and whatever else they grow to be delivered in real time to all the customers around Christchurch. I don't sell energy, I merely do this delivery. Do I really run this delivery business? So delivery is really what drives my costs and this thing I, I wake up and think about in the morning, about how I'm going to manage my network load so I don't have to build such a big network. Because obviously a bigger network has environmental implications, has cost implications and so on. So back in the early 1990s, Transpower came to us and said they're going to have to build a big new transmission line around about, around about the year 2000 to meet growing peak loads in the upper South Island. All the energy in the South Island comes from down in the Southern Lakes, there's very little of it as comes locally. Coleridge is really just a tiny little blip, really. So they came to us and said, look, we're going to have to spend a couple of hundred million dollars building big new transmission lines from Christ, from Twyers or the Christchurch, and that's going to cost this much money, and you guys will be paying for it. And so we had a bit of a think about whether there are other alternatives or things we could do. And over time, you can see, we really have to decouple the, our peak load growth and our energy load growth. Our peak load has hardly grown in that last, over, over that last, um, sort of almost 20 year period, while well, energy, energy, energy demand has continued to grow at about 1.5% per annum. So of late though we've been thinking about what other sort of, and we've done this sort of variety of things which I'm going to talk about, but I was going to just talk about how now sort of the whole wider energy environment I think is going to change. This is, um, this is just a graph showing Tiapiti. Tiapiti is a big meridian wind farm. And you can see there, its output varies 
it varies a lot. It jumps up and down depending on when the wind's blowing or not blowing. In fact, the funny thing is what we, what we found, what the generators were found with the generation in that, in that um, area around the Tower Rivers, the Manawatu region, is it tends to be reasonably positively correlated with the hydro inflows. So the wet years tend to be slightly windier and the dry years tend to be slightly drier. But you can see there, there's a, there's a the way the low, the way the generation jumps around and a way that it doesn't jump around with hydro. Someone else controls the governor, if you like. So when I look at that, I go, how are we going to keep the lights on in the future? And one way we're going to do it is we're going to do it by using hydro to meet the load when the, when the, when the wind drops off. But are we also going to manage load, manage customer's load or manage hot water load when the wind isn't blowing? Here's another little graph. There's an outrageous number showing heat pump sales. Just an amazing number, isn't it? So they've gone from something like 30,000 a year to 120,000 in one, two, three, four or five years. Factor of four. And it's kind of interesting, we, we've been worrying a bit about this at Orion, thinking about was this going to add to our peak loads. And so far it doesn't seem to have done that. Um, we've done a bit of stuff where we've mined the databases, looking at people's energy consumption when they went on the, um, the Environment Canterbury Clean Heat Programme. And what we've seen is that even when customers have taken out a wood burner or an open fire, overall their electricity consumption hasn't tended to increase. Those people on that ECAN program though had to put an insulation at the same time, so it's a, it's a subgroup of the wider group. But it is interesting that, they, that we haven't actually seen any significant increases in our peak load despite what you're seeing there. What we also think is a lot of people have replaced less efficient um, electric heating with more efficient heat pumps. But I guess I see these, all these heat pumps as an opportunity. I, I see it as an opportunity to try and manage heat pump load with things like the variability of the wind. So if the wind isn't blowing or it stops blowing suddenly, if you want to keep the lights on, everybody likes their lights, their lights staying on. I think everybody discovered that on September the 4th. Um, what are the loads we can turn off just for short periods of time to try and keep the lights going? 